Thank you. Um, I'm supposed to talk about the IPCC and models, and then I find out this morning that Patrick Michaels gave an excellent talk on the climate models. And several years ago, Pat and I worked on a project with Heartland to give several presentations at Heartland meetings, and so I fear that he and I were working out of the same playbook. So the problem is, if I gave the talk that I had planned to give, it would sound like Yogi Berra and um, Deja Vu all over again. And by golly, Pat's even scooped me on the use of um, references to baseball personalities. But in any event, I'm going to press the Great Reset and therefore talk about uh, some of the things Pat didn't get to and sort of fill in the gaps with the IPCC models as well. One of the things when we think about models is we think it's supposed to be a representation of the climate system. It's supposed to be a, a, a microcosm of reality. And in some cases, we feel that it's supposed to represent everything the real thing does and be useful for a wide variety of topics. That isn't necessarily the case. I mean, models are designed to do some things well, and sometimes they're in designed intentionally not to do some things well because that's not their point. So a model is really only as good as it was as the, the design for which it was created. For example, if we consider model train, this might be an excellent model to use if we're interested in describing what life was like in the late 1800s in the Lackawanna Valley of Pennsylvania. But if we wanted to use this model to determine what might happen if the forces of physics take over and the train goes a little bit too fast around the curve, well, maybe this model isn't very good after all. And it's the same with climate models. Climate models don't necessarily do everything well, and there are certain things that they're very useful for and certain things that they aren't. And one of the things we do with a climate model is we attempt to be able to represent the Earth's system. So we take the atmosphere, the cryosphere, the ice, the lithosphere, the Earth's surface, the hydrosphere, which includes the oceans and water on the land surface. We take the um, biosphere, life on Earth. We take all of these things that we understand, even though we understand them incompletely, but we take all of these things and we try to describe them in a series of mathematical equations. And then we take the mathematical equations and we convert them to computer code and we try to run that computer code and see what's likely to happen. But the problem is that we don't have an infinite amount of computer resources. So we have to make some assumptions and, and approximations. And so, for example, we can't run time uh, every second. We use you know, an hour as a time scale. Spatially, we use large boxes, as you can see here, to describe the land surface. And of course, there's lots of things going on inside these boxes and within the time scale that's very important but that we simply cannot model in the climate model itself. So that becomes a limitation in the climate model. We have to approximate that by some sort of uh, a series of equations that are not modeling the physics, but reality are modeling a statistical assumption as to what the physics would give us so we can try to estimate what the fluxes of energy, mass, and momentum would be across the interfaces of these boxes. Now, We've talked before about these data sets, and I won't go back into these, but essentially what we often do is compare them to the satellite record, which you've also seen several times here today. The idea then is we can take climate models and we can run them, and we can see how well they do. These are the 40, uh, first CMA, um, 40 of the first CMIP-6 model runs. I took the idea from John Christie, went to the KNMI Model Explorer, downloaded them and plotted them up, and showed uh, the curve associated here with the uh, University of Alabama Huntsville satellite record. And as everybody mentions and several people have mentioned today as well, the idea is that the climate models tend to overstate the case. That is, they, as we say, run hot. They tend to have too much warming over time relative to what we would expect to see. And in general, what we want it to look at here is not that the models overstate this case, but to try to figure out why the models do so. In other words, what is the diagnostics as to why the models wind up overstating the rise in temperature?
And I can't seem to go backwards, okay. So the idea is, let's say we, we went out to Las Vegas Motor Speedway and we have a car. And for some reason, our race car, thank you, for some reason our race car is running too slow. And we want to diagnose what happened. So we might bring it into the pits and open the hood and look at the engine and find out what's going on with the uh, fuel injector or maybe it's something in the exhaust to try to figure out what the car is doing. But it might be better, too, to sit up in the stands and watch the driver operate the car. And maybe the driver is slowing down too soon on entry to the curve, or maybe coming out of the curve, he's not getting on the gas fast enough. In other words, it might not be the car that's totally the problem. It might be the way in which the car is being driven. And so that's something that I want to look at today, since I only have about 10 more minutes to go, to look at why climate models overstate the case. And I'm not going to argue anything particularly for the problem inside the hood of the climate model, but rather I think it's the way climate models are applied. And so there are two fundamental reasons, in my view, why climate models run hot. And it's described by this simple equation that the change in temperature with respect to time, which is the curve that you saw before, is equal to how the model sees a change in temperature for a given change in carbon dioxide, and how the change in carbon dioxide plays out in the model over time. These are products, so you multiply the two together, and it'll be my argument by the end that both of those terms are overestimated, and as a result, therefore, the model representation of the change in temperature over time will be overestimated. So let's look first at the first term. And that's often referred to as the climate sensitivity, as several people today have mentioned. The idea is that it's the response of the model by temperature to a change in carbon dioxide. Now, one of the things we found out, and again, the, I'll speed through this quickly because Pat did an excellent job of talking about it, is a researcher at the University of Oklahoma once, and I got into a, a discussion, I'll leave it at that, and the argument he made was, look, these models are all physically based. The idea is we take the physics, we put them into the model, we essentially therefore turn those into computer equations, we run the computer um, and we get an answer, and the answer we get is based on physics, there isn't any subjectivity in there. And I said, you know very well that's not true because there's all sorts of things happening at subgrid scales that we can't model. We can't figure out what's going on, and so really what we have is a regression equation. Now granted, we may know a little bit more about it so that instead of using simple linear regression, we may be able to specify the actual terms a little bit better, but let's face it, the coefficients are no different than regression coefficients, and in some cases, you don't have any data to specify what they're likely to be. So you simply make something up that gives you an answer that looks good. Well, I don't think he bought my answer at the time, but now we have the proof in the bullet in the AMS in uh, March of 2017. There was the article, The Art and Science of Climate Model Tuning, and of course the two famous quotes uh, that Pat referred to in this case, the models are optimized to perform better on a particular metric. I once had a, a paper that I was trying to get published looking at air temp or, excuse me, precipitation evaluation using our uh, global precipitation data set. And one of the modeling group people complained bitterly, saying, look, uh, it's unfair to compare that model that I published with uh, your data. If you really wanted to compare my model for precipitation, you should have asked me, and I would have given you a model run that was optimized to do precipitation. Um, that's not how we do science, and that's not how the models should be evaluated. Uh, and as, as Pat mentioned very, very well, uh, the cultural identity of given model uh, makes a lot of some of this thing subjective. Of course, I said we're playing from the same playbook, so here's the second quote that he also used. By keeping this, some, this equilibrium climate sensitivity in the anticipated acceptable range, the problem with the climate models is, again, the response of temperature to carbon dioxide is not physically based, it's subjectively based. So these, these modelers can choose what they want and it gives you the output. Again, my argument is that is not how science operates. So in particular, 
what we look at over time is the equilibrium climate sensitivity have been estimated by a number of people from independent assessments. And back about uh, the first, first and second assessments of the IPCC, the estimates were somewhere in the order between 5 and 9 degrees Fahrenheit. And over time, these independent estimates have started to decrease. So when we start to plot a number of these, um, you can see how temperature, or how, excuse me, the equilibrium climate sensitivity is decreasing over time. Unfortunately, both the models and the IPCC have not followed suit because these two curves right here is IPCC fifth assessment report and uh, CMIP 5 and the CMIP 6 and IPCC AR6 are out here. So you can see that based upon independent assessments, they have not kept up with the times. They're using an equilibrium climate sensitivity that is much greater than they should be. So let's go to the, I should say, so that's why essentially in this case the models run hot and that's one of the reasons why I am not enthused when I see that some models are actually following that black line real well. The problem is, again, I can make a model that has no response to carbon dioxide. It's not probably realistic at all, but I can do anything. Why? Because the climate models are tuned to however I want it to come out. And again, my argument is that's not how science should operate. And so while the models have lots of benefits in helping us understand processes, maybe trying to figure out what the future is going to look like isn't one of their good, powerful bailiwick uh, things that they should be used for. The second term is how CO2 is presented over time, and that is the change in CO2 with respect to time. The problem is this is being forecast out in the future. So we have really no idea how the CO2 curve is going to respond. So we have to make some sort of assumptions as to what we think the climate is going to look like or the carbon dioxide concentrations are going to look like at some point into the future. One of the things we used to use was called the Representative Concentration Pathways, or RCP. The number after it represents how much watts per square meter of additional forcing will be introduced into the climate system by 2100. And you can see it would give you a temperature rise of somewhere between 3.6 Fahrenheit and about 9 Fahrenheit. The new paradigm is to use something called the Shared Socioeconomic Pathways, which really isn't much different than the RCPs. You can see we still use the same watts per square meter of additional forcing by 2100, and we get a temperature rises of somewhere between 2.7 and 9 degrees Fahrenheit as well. But then the question is, which one of these makes sense? And as I said, again, Pat beat me to it. But the idea is that there was an, uh, a, a report from the United States Geologic Survey by uh, Toronto et al. In fact, Toronto was a graduate student at the University of Delaware. But in particular, they looked at one of the issues associated with the National Climate Assessment in particular. And the concern was that these National Climate Assessments were based on very extreme scenarios, such as the RP RCP 8.5, which would be the top curve. And you can see here, this is a climate alarmist group still uh, decided that is a highly unlikely scenario, and even the next one down is unlikely. These are often played off as business as usual. They're not. They're not anywhere close to what business as usual should be. So the issue then is we should be using scenarios that are much more realistic. The problem then is we should base this, and this was one of the things Betsy Weatherhead was trying to push with the National Climate, Fifth National Climate Assessment, was to use SSPs down in this range. It's okay to report the others, but we need to make clear that they're based upon extreme scenarios, and we should use pathways of business as usual, essentially that are more realistic. The problem is 80 to 90 percent of the papers you see and almost everything that is reported by the IPCC and was reported by the last National Climate Assessment are these extreme scenarios, particularly the ARCP 8.5s and now the SSP 5s 8.5s. These are significantly overstating the amount of carbon dioxide that should exist and the rise in carbon dioxide. And that makes the second term too large as well. So when I showed this curve earlier, I didn't tell you what SSP we were using. And in fact, this curve from KNMI is based on SSP 2-4.5 
which is a more reasonable one. But of course, as I said, most people like to use the extreme scenario because it gives you a much bigger bang for the buck, as it were, and it gives you a bigger statement at the end of saying what climate change is going to be, makes it more alarmist, makes people more responsive, and gets all of that across. And so if we look at what it would be using SSP 8.5, you can see it is quite a bit different over time. And so in particular, that's part of the problem, is that the scenario we use for changing carbon dioxide over time has, not necessarily, has been the most extreme scenario and not necessarily the best one that we should be using. So as a result, if we come back to my equation, you can see now my argument is that climate models tend to overstate climate sensitivity and then they overstate the rate at which carbon dioxide is changing over time since it's the product of those two that gives us the model simulation of the change in temperature over time. Therefore, that estimate of the climate change by temperature is overstated, and that's why we say the climate models run hot, and that's why in our case out at the, the Speedway, our car would be running slow. So thank you very much for your attention, and I think our next presenter is Cork Hayden.